hello to you, Claudia, <laughs> Rankin in, in America. Thank you so very, very much for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's and good exciting. E and good evening to our viewers here in Denmark. I forgot about the time, the, the time difference. And thank you so very much for being with us as well. When I read Just Us, your latest book that came out a couple of months ago, I, I'd been looking forward to that book for a long time because Citizen was such a, a great book. I really loved it also because it reminded me of the quality of physical encounters because it came out at a time when we couldn't really meet people in public anymore. And there are so many meetings with strangers in that book and how much they're weaved into a community of different situations and how you bring the experience of meeting a stranger somewhere in an airport and you talk to your husband about it and they, then later you referred to a therapist and it reminded me of everything that we're deprived of at the moment here in Denmark, meeting strangers in, in public. So, so I was wondering, how, how do you feel under this lockdown? How did you experience this? Well, I, I agree that so much of what delights me in life is the accidental encounter because you never know how it's going to go and 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 you know who who the other person will be but i have to admit that i have loved being home for the last <laughs> year i you know i i traveled so much in the last decade but this year i got to read hang out with my family um i discovered we had a backyard which was exciting. <laughs> we bought some, you know, furniture for the backyard. People sat back there. So um, I will be happy to, I'm sort of done with the pandemic now and I'll be happy to return to the world. But I liked the time. It was sort of a, a kind of refresh mode. When I've read Citizen, it struck me how rarely I read books that explore the quotidian in the same way the the common life that very often literature you have descriptions of dramatic events in your life of falling in love or someone dying but these are everyday encounters where you explore and disclose the drama of it at, at that point it reminded me a bit of Marcel Proust actually that there's this literary exploring the dramas in your everyday life that you usually don't think think about and it's like you've taken this to a new level in, in in just us with a with kind of a program of meeting strangers can you tell us how this book came about the program for the book that you described well i i teach at yale university and um i have a class on whiteness and looking at white supremacy and the ways in which it's institutional and shows up and my students are always um, interviewing each other. You know, I say, go and think about how white supremacy works in your life. And they come back and say, I talked to my dad, I talked to my mom, I interviewed my roommate. And I thought, oh, I should do that. <laughs> I should start just asking the people around me. And so that's how that started. I, I, and because I travel so much, I thought the place that I am most often encountering white men in particular is you know in airport um lounges and on the plane and so i decided that i would consciously engage if people seemed like they wanted to engage but there was also a political context of it that you describe in the book that you say it was a car it was it was a comment in the current political climate at the time that you should engage in conversation with people that you that you normally don't speak to. So it's mm -hmm. also a book shaped by the presidency of Donald Trump. Is that not, or, or the context of Donald Trump? Yeah, no, that is, I, 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 you know, he's gone from the presidency. So maybe I'm, I'm trying to get him out of my yeah. head, but, <laughs> but I, I, that is also true. We were, I think under Trump, um, I don't want to say Trump created the, the hostility and white supremacy and segregationist policies that exist in the United States, but he amplified them um, by coming out and um, overtly embrace, embracing them and embracing um, um, white nationalists. And he himself, I think, probably identifies as such. And so um, 
politically, we were at a time where people could not speak to each other. And there is a, um, an aggressive canceling mode that's in, in place here in the United States. People refuse conversation, they refuse engagement. And that was also something I wanted to sort of push up against in, in the making of this book. In the, the former book, Citizen, it was narrated by the second person singular, the you. And for me, as a white male reading the book, it put me in a lot of situations where, where I'd never been before and forced me to reflect on my liberties that I take for granted. And I realized that maybe that mobility is what they refer to as white privilege. Maybe mm -hmm. that is actually it. So that was very powerful for me reading the book that it was told in the second person. Because, uh, of course, I'm not you, but I, mm -hmm. I was taking on the role and the position uh, in the exchanges. This book is written by the first person singular, the I. And I know the end of Citizen returns to the I, but mm. wh why did you choose the first person this time? Well, Citizen, I did a lot of interviews. And so many of those stories belong to other people. So the, it would have been problematic to tell them um, as my story. So already I, I needed a different approach. And then I really wanted people to be able to climb into those prose pieces and determine whether or not they were subject to the abuse or they themselves might um, stand by and watch it happen or in fact be the aggressor. And that decision was up to the reader. So the you became not a pronoun, but a space that you mm. enter. And then you make that decision for yourself, you know? Um, with Just Us, because the book is basically an invitation into a process, I thought I should show up for that process. I shouldn't invite you to something that I myself am not engaged in. And so the the use of the first person was intentional. I, you know, I, I thought in this book, I'm gonna show up as me in my life um, with my husband <laughs> in, <laughs> in therapy, with my friends in our conversations. And um, as a form of a, a kind of pedagogy in a way, the book is not um, meant to instruct, but it's meant to perform something that then hopefully the reader will perform in their own life um, or become self-conscious around in their own life. I can say that at least to, that happened to us because we read the book in my family. So your conversation that that goes on with your husband and your therapist, they come down here as a book and we bring it on in, in, in our homes and the situation that we play them, we, we play them together. There's also the, the shape of your book or the composition that you have your words on one side and then you have factual evidence and anecdotal evidence and historical reference on the other side. That seemed to me almost like a comment on this and um, this anti-fact movement in, or, or this contesting fact or fake news and this collective difficulty of actually establishing a common reality in, in, mm -hmm. in America. What was the background for that choice? Exactly what you just said. <laughs> it was, no, exactly. Uh, you, should, um, you and I should work on books together. <laughs> um, the idea was to, you know, we have, Part of the, let's put it this way, part of the difficulty in engaging in the states right now is that suddenly we realized that there were certain people, and let's just say people who watch Fox News, who um, had a different set of facts, a different set of beliefs that weren't based on anything credible, but the fact that they heard it on Fox News, let's say. And um, so we were, people had different um, takes on what was real. And even when you showed tapes, videos, viral evidence, they were like, no, 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 this is what's really happening. And, and, and our president was encouraging fake news, in fact, and suppressing actual news. And so I wanted to say, no, there, there, there are different kinds of ways of going about acquiring knowledge and supporting what you say. And here are some of them. 
Sometimes it's um, sociology, sometimes it's historical, sometimes it's anecdotal. But here's, here are some ways where we can step out of the idea that fake news is news. Well, I understand the project and I see it's very needed in the, in the climate in the US and actually here as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's brought to light, how do we constitute a common reality as mm -hmm. a democratic challenge? And we, if we don't have a common reality, we don't have a common conversation. So it's extreme in America, but it's brought to light that it's a, mm -hmm. a problem here. But you must have had some questions to yourself. Where is the limit for that? What should I? What kind of fact should I bring in? What What can actually be evidenced by fact? And sometimes you use evidence that is more anecdotal or just uh, references. What, what were your re reflections on the limits of of the fact part of your book? Well, I the. It might be helpful to know that I wrote the essays after it's perhaps, um, let's say you and I had a, a conversation. I then went home and wrote down that conversation. I hired for this book project, a therapist. I also hired a fact checker. Um, that's what he does in his life <laughs> and um, mostly for um, legal things. And um, so I wrote my version of our conversation. I went to the therapist and I read it to her and we discussed why I might've said what I said and why I think the person might've said what they said. And that would have informed a revision of the essay. And then once I had that, I then gave it to the fact checker. So many of the directions that the, the um, recto verso page goes on in terms of what is being fact checked had to do with things that he questioned that I might have stated. You know, you say that um, white men make up 35% of the population, um, but it's actually 33.2, you know? <laughs> so those kinds of things um, came back after the fact checking happened. And I also fact checked certain things. Then once I um, did that, I, I, the, the pieces were read by a lawyer and also sociologists. And they would say, well, you, you, know, you, you quote this sociologist, but maybe you should also bring in this other one because they, you know, so they had a kind of um, background information of internal um, conflicts in that. And once all that was done, I would take the essay and give it to you. And I would say to you, Rune, is this a conversation we had as far as you remember? And would you like to write a response? And um, sometimes people said, um, yeah, it's a conversation we had. I don't need to write a response. It reflects what happened. Sometimes they said, it's the conversation we had. It's what I said, but it's not what I meant. And so then they wrote their own response as to what they meant. And those are in the book because I also said, I will publish your response and I won't change it. I'll, whatever you send to me is what I'll publish. And so the, their responses are at the end of each essay section. What and then I respond to that. You, you mentioned that it's kind of an instruction, the book, but when you read it, you you find out that you are a, a, a teacher and a student as well, that, that it's an education of you as well. So I thought it was mm -hmm. very interesting that you, you took the assignments of your students onto yourself. And I thought that role play was kind of some symbolic. I'm a student here as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what did you learn about your own presentation of facts, having them afterwards checked by others? Well, um, I think mostly they're not that far off, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't have a photographic memory, but I do stay in the correct ballpark <laughs> in terms of um, percentages, um, things like that. So I, I, if I had any anxiety about Alzheimer's, they were put to rest <laughs> for, at least for the moment. Um, and I was very self-conscious because I knew that you would, you know, whoever I was in conversation with, would get the essay back. And, and 
were able to say, no, she just made this up. So I, you know, I was being very conscientious in terms of what I remembered. The thing though that was important is I didn't know when I would encounter a conversation that would end up in a book. I literally was just in my life and I might have gone three weeks and done all kinds of things. And none of those conversations seemed like they needed more investigation. And then randomly, I would go to a, um, a dinner party and suddenly all hell broke loose. And then that, you know, if it stayed with me, if it bothered me, if it troubled me in some way, then it usually ended up in the book. How did that change your way of dealing with other people, knowing that this could be the material of a book, that every time you entered a conversation or you stood next to a white male in the airport or you were at a dinner, did that change the, your own way of maneuvering in the social reality? You know, it didn't because I didn't assume it would end up in the book. So I wasn't consciously thinking about it 24 seven. Um, I, 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 I think it's honest to say that in none of the conversations did I get to a moment in the conversation when I thought this is going to be in the book. I, I had, I just was in that moment and I wasn't thinking about the book. I wasn't thinking. And, and then something, you know, my friend wouldn't go, I would have no way to know that she wouldn't get up and go on stage when they said white people go on stage until the moment she doesn't do it. And then at that moment, I'm not thinking about the book, I'm thinking about her. And I'm like, what's going on here? What's wrong with you? And, um, you know, so it's only afterwards, as it continues to turn itself over and over and over in my head, that I think, okay, this one I'm writing down. So, th so there are many scenes that seem very, uh, very good for the book that, you know, you meet this person in the airport, and he says, I don't see color. I think that's an airport meeting. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, a very, that's a very interesting exchange that you have a after that. Because I think I could, have said, I could have said the same thing, meaning it very well. But I, mm -hmm. I realized when I read it that, of course, he sees color because he says this to someone that he evidently mm -hmm. sees, mm -hmm. sees his black. So you didn't know at the time that that would end up in the book. No. Um, how did you choose the title, Just Us? As a foreigner, when, when I think we, when I read something in English, I, I read more significance into it because it's not my, my daily language. So I thought it was just the most genius title that it could be just the US, just America. And it could be justice America or only us. Uh, you know, I could, there were so many meanings to, to, to this title. Uh, and then I found out that it came from a comedian and I found it on the internet where, 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 where he said it. How, how did you choose it? I chose it the way you chose it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I mean, initially, I chose Just Us because um, I wanted it to have the sonic um, justice. I wanted just you, just the two of us, and um, and I wanted the U.S. Just U.S. Once the book was made, I sent it to the artist. Um, Alexandra Bell. And Alexandra said to me, did you take this from the title from Richard Pryor? Yeah. And I said, no, I didn't. And she said, well, you should, you should put an epigraph because he has this P. So then I went on the internet and did what you did. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> like, I was like, oh yeah, there it is. So then I, I um, added it as an epigraph, but I hadn't known about the, um, the Richard Pryor um, joke earlier. Okay. There's a, in the book, you engage in situations that we know through a lot of academic concepts that, that is kind of testing what we talk about theoretically. And you, and there's a certain mistrust of these concepts. You, you write that these phrases, white fragility, white defensiveness, white appropriation have a habit of standing in for the complicated mess of a true conversation. I love the complicated mess of a true conversation. 
what, what do you mean by that, that these concepts stand in the way for that? Well, I think, um, you know, Robin D'Angelo, her book, White Fragility, is a book I really admire and I um, have given it to a lot of people to read. And I love that she has named these dynamics in a way that we can easily refer to them. You know, if a white woman cries in a moment of um, being confronted around racism, that's white fragility. Okay, we know that's what it's named. So that was that's useful, but I think we've gotten to the point in the culture now where people are dismissive because they, no longer are interested in slow time, looking at the thing and understanding the dynamic and understanding you have two human beings there who are trying to negotiate a thing. Instead, it's, it's, it's categorized and put away as that, as white fragility, as white defensiveness. And we are not spending the time to really understand what's going on. And the best example for me would be um, January 6th. You have, you know, the majority of insurrection, you know, um, domestic terrorists storming the White House and many of them are white men. And it's true that what they're doing is illegal, what they're doing is wrong and undemocratic. But it's also interesting to me why they're doing it. What is at stake for them? What do they feel they're losing? What has allowed them to leave their homes in, in states all over the country? What is that emergency? What is, what, is, what is breaking apart inside of them that they're willing to, to do this? And so I think if you just call that white rage or white this or white that, you lose that underneath the actions, something else is going, there's another current running. And so I'm sort of interested in those, and that's what a conversation can bring us closer to knowing. It also seems that these concepts can have a way of actually polarizing people that they should bring together that you mentioned uh, in your book also <clears throat> how people bring up just the word affirmative action and then there's a conflict or, or or white male privilege. If you use that word, then then you have a conflict that you mm -hmm. have a way of naming conflicts that accelerates the conflicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no. Yeah, let me. But that's that's I think tied to to what I was saying that I, you know, when I first asked white men about white privilege, I was surprised. I thought, okay. What's wrong with that? You know, I'm just saying <laughs> that if you said to me, you know, you're a black woman, I'd be like, yeah, I'm a black woman. And I'm like, you, you're a white man with white male privilege. And, and, and what, but the rage that came with it at times and um, the dismissal was surprising to me. And so I, I really became sort of curious, what, what is being pushed at and this, and it was, if only um, I had had the discussion before with a few white men, maybe privately, I might've understood it a little bit better. <laughs> but I think people felt that I was dismissing all of their life's work. They had worked hard to get where they, and, and, and they didn't understand. And I really believe some of them didn't understand that the ability to work hard is itself the privilege, to be able to work hard and to get the thing to work out <laughs> is the privilege. Like, and, and I'm talking simply about the mobility of being able to move around spaces and move in the world and do the things you wanna do. And they're thinking that I'm questioning their dedication, hard work, longevity, um, all of that. And, and so it took a while to get to the point where I'm like, no, 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 you know, I'm sure you worked hard, but how did you get to be able to work hard in order to achieve what you have achieved? There's a, in, in, in the, the start, the opening of the book, which is very beautiful, the what if part, and there's this call for change, and you don't want that 
call for change to change, but you feel bullied by that call for change mm -hmm. as, as, well, uh, as well. And then in the end, there's someone asking then what's the strategy? Uh, and they're, you know, like these activists saying, what, what are we, we, you know, we're an activist newspaper. We always ask people, what's the strategy? How do you bring mm -hmm. it out? How do you go from theory to action? But it appears to me that there is a very clear strategy in your book, which is like staying in these, in the true mess of conversation, staying in this uh, dialogue of discomfort and, and that maybe these concepts are not helping you in that direction. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, in as much as they foreclose a conversation, they're not. I, I think sometimes concepts are destinations that people feel that you must arrive at and you should do it quickly. And, and I feel like the concepts are there and we know what they are naming, but if one is resisting it, it might be interesting to find out why. That they're, you know, that they're holding on to something else. And what is that? And it, it might be something that I need to know about. Um, because then if the more I know about you, the closer we can get to understanding where the discord really resides. And it seems to me that a part of, of what I see as, as maybe not the strategy, but the way of proceeding here is building up a common world. Actually, in the, there's this very mm -hmm. beautiful scene where you're saying something about that's the height of male privilege or something like that. And he's laughing and you share something, but you don't know if it's the same mm -hmm. thing that you're sharing. It's this project of building a common world that includes misunderstanding. Is, is mm -hmm. that a correct reading, do you think? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That, um, you know, it's not that we will behave the same way or have the same ideas about what solutions should be um, applied, but we have to get to a point where we can agree on, on some things, on the reality in front of us and our commitment, you know, in this country, perhaps our commitment to a democratic system. If we could agree on that, then we might be able to agree that we, we do want people to have access to voting, you know, and or we do want them to have access to health care. And that that in fact benefits all of us, not just some of us. And and so it's I think we need to um I, I like the reference to Proust because I I do think we need to slow things down and begin to understand that the domestic day-to-day -day is relevant, is as relevant as the larger spectacle of um ideas and the big ideas and the big commitments and the the activism that is towards um, certain things. But we, we have to honor that people still are negotiating a day-to-day -day life. And, and, and what, what are the, 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 the things that they think that we don't know for each other, you know, whatever that is, I, you know, everybody, it's different, but I, um, so I agree with you that a common ground, some set of a common ground and some um, commitment to pedagogy actually, to, to actually doing the work of, of finding out what is true, what is real, <laughs> what is relevant. <laughs> yeah, and I think what is so beautiful about the book is that it, this is a perspective in every single conversation that you have or it could appear in, in every single conversation. But of course, when you, when you have that close reading of your daily encounters and meetings, there's also the, the, the risk of it becoming too much that you read a lot into this situation. And there's a, I, I think maybe it's in Citizen that someone says, uh, you shouldn't be too absorbed with the world, that, that mm -hmm. you, you should read. And, and I have that sense at times in just us as well, that you're asking yourself, well, is it just me or is this in the real world? Is this just, is, how did you experience that risk writing just us that you're reading all sorts of conflict into just concrete everyday situations? Well, the, the, the exercise of the book is about close reading. And, you know, I don't really go around in my real life like this, you know, <laughs> thinking, wait, can, you know, can I, I would, I would get nothing done and I would go nowhere. Um, 
But in, in the writing of the essay, I, I really wanted to put everything under a microscope because I, you know, I, was, I, I wanted to know in the times that we're not thinking, what was hmm. driving that engine? We were, you know, even when we think we're not thinking, we're responding to certain things. And those might have already been decided a long time ago. And um, so the only way to know if I'm making a decision now or if I'm sort of reacting or responding or moving ahead based on some things that have been decided a long time ago is to look and see. And so I wanted just us to be that moment where I looked to see. I, but yeah, you're not the only one. People said, this is a little claustrophobic in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I think it's back, I think it's, I think it's, it's back and forth, but that's some outcries from the writer here. Am I too much here? Or is mm -hmm. this just me? Or is this just reality? I was so curious when I, when I read also, don't let me be lonely, what it meant to you that you were not born in America, that, that you know, there's this book, Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie that was read a lot mm -hmm. here in, in mm -hmm. Denmark. And she said that she didn't realize she was black until she came to America. Uh, that, that is in this book. Do you feel that, that you, you being born, and I think you were seven when you came to America, mm -hmm. is that correct? Do you feel that you have a kind of double consciousness as regards to America because you were born in another country? I think initially, yes. I don't think that's true now. I mean, I've lived here now um, 51 years. So, um, so, and I was educated here and my friends are here. So it's now I don't think I, I split off, but I do think when I was little, my mother who, you know, she came to this country in her thirties and um, her view was there was us, her family and those people out there. And, um, and she had moved into a whole new culture. And so she, she actually would use the phrase, you know, don't trust white people. And that came not based on experience, but like, this is the knowledge I have to impart to you <laughs> now that we were in this country, don't trust them. Um, <laughs> And so I think as a kid in school, I, start, I, I really questioned everything in terms of why, why is this happening? Why is she doing that? Um, how do I understand that? And maybe that's just the immigrant um, way of being in, in the adopted country. I don't know. Um, but I think a little bit of that has stayed with me so that I don't take things for granted. I, I, even now, I think I have a two a, a two time rule. Like the first time, I think it's um, idiosyncratic or random, and then the second time you do a thing, I think, oh, this is happening a second time, and then the third time, I'm willing to say, oh, that person is racist, so that person is <laughs> said, but I give it three times because. For me, repetition is insistence, and um, and so I wait because I, you know, I think people are people, and I think um, all of us have her moments, our, our days, or our strange um, calculations we're making in our head. So you never, you can never trust that first encounter. But by the third one, I'm pretty, I'm ready to <laughs> make claims. <laughs> If I jump a little, because we don't have so much time left and there are so many questions, I, I, I want to ask you. You had a president who he proudly claimed that he was a nationalist, that, that, that and it's in, in the book as well. Now you have a president who in his inaugural address says that he wants to confront, confront white supremacy. And I think he said it quite openly. It was open mm -hmm. for interpretation. You could say this was, this was just the 1%. But you could also read it as he was saying, this is part of our culture. This is part of our heritage. Uh, how did you read the, the, the address? I read it um, as President Biden um, 
admitting that white supremacy was a fundamental structural element in the United States. And for that, I was very grateful because, you know, I, we have never heard somebody in his position make that claim before. He also referred to white nationalists um, as domestic terrorists, which was another thing we haven't heard. You know, under, under Trump, there weren't any white nationalists who were terrorists, you know. And um, so I have a lot of um, hope for this administration. Um, I, I think he has been very clear that he is interested in dismantling the ways in which this country was set up to serve white people only and to open it out to, um, to all of us, um, not just us as, as white people. So, and I, and I know a lot of people who are now in his administration and these are people with careers dedicated to creating equity and, um, and, and social justice, um, and some of whom have been involved in grassroots organizations. So, so you know, I'm, I, I have made a commitment to myself that I'm not gonna work on any projects, any big projects for at least a year. I wanna see what this government does and how it works. And, and the first big test is the, um, is the trial this week, I think. We will see how the Senate behaves around um, the impeachment trial, because it's important that he be held accountable for, for storming the government. And that's the end of the Trump presidency. And then you have these two events, the end of the Trump presidency, the beginning of the Biden presidency. It's very difficult in Denmark, you know, my kids growing up in schools here, they know a lot about racism in America yeah. and black people, both from their popular music and from, and from Netflix. And they, you know, this is like, I think they know more about that, that than they do about some of the Danish Kings actually. Uh, <laughs> so, so we're culturally, we're American, but, but politically and socially, we're not American. So we're seeing it at a distance and seeing it at a distance. It seems that you have had this very strong Black Lives Matter movement at the, that you had really a national awakening at the end of the Trump presidency. And that, that was how the Democrats won Georgia, the decisive seats of, of the Senate. And that is kind of a foundation for the Biden presidency. Do you see that as well? There's an anti-racist movement that is a new foundation for the for the Democratic Party and for Joe Biden. I, I do see that. I do. Um, Black Lives Matter was an incredibly important um, organization that has been at work for the last decade. So it didn't just happen, you know. I those people that have um, been meeting and educating themselves and. Um, and having uh, um, counter groups like Surge showing up for racial justice, say her name, Kimberly Crenshaw's group, all of that work was being done. I remember once going, I was giving a reading um, in Brooklyn. And as I was driving up to the place where I was supposed to read, I saw lines of people. And I'm thinking, are they all coming to my reading? <laughs> and in fact, they were not, they were going, to a showing up for racial justice meeting across the street. And that, and I wanted to actually abort my reading and join them. <laughs> and, uh, so all of that work has been going on year in and year out. And so by the time we had um, the protests, people were ready. And what's new about this moment um, and makes it different, I, I think radically different from the civil rights movement is that the um, intersectionality around civil rights movement was done in the name of black people. Whereas I think now um, people, all people, Asian people, white people, all kinds of people are showing up for themselves because they understand that it's their lives that are on siege. It's their um, planet that 
needs protecting. It's, you know, they're the ones without health care. They're the ones who have um, precarity when it comes to housing or jobs, et cetera. So Black Lives Matter has become an umbrella organization where now everybody sees it as an avenue to make the country a better place. It's very interesting. They've become an inspiration here in Denmark as well. So now you have the Danish football, national football team. They're kneeling before the... <laughs> before. As they should. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's very interesting that we get the racism from from America culturally, but we also get the anti-racism. You know, we get mm -hmm. the Trump presidency, which is in our lives and in our televisions and in our heads. And then we get the other inspiration as well. But when, I wouldn't say you get the racism from, I think from colonialism, from your immigration issues, all kinds of stuff are at play oh. in, in, you know, but you're right, you get the, what's happening in this country on both sides coming, coming at you. Yeah, it's but, definitely yeah. not the only source of racism. Yeah. In yeah. Definitely, definitely not. And to some extent, America is an historically a lot more anti-imperialist, anti-colonial than we are here in, in Europe. And we have our own struggles. But yeah. you have your own struggles. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, definitely. But I think something that people struggle to really understand in America is why certain words can become so prohibitive in public discourse. I mean, all everyone here is anti-Trump. I, I mean, it's like 95% of the population. But I th when, when people get fired for using the N-word in a newspaper meeting or something, I think this is something that we don't understand here. Mm -hmm. I mean, culturally and politically, people are, are with you all the way, but this is something that is difficult to understand. Can, can you ex educate us and explain why, what, what is going on? Well, I think people are um, at a point now where they are trying to sort of, um, if I'm trying to come up with a metaphor, you know, like weed the garden from the roots rather than <laughs> yeah. cut it and then have it grow back. So the removing of monuments, for example, if you believe that racism and um, Confederate um, soldiers, let's say, are are part of um, an attempt to dehumanize people in the way that um, the Nazis were in in Germany. Why would you put statues of those kinds of people up to be admired, to be remembered? So hence, in the same way you wouldn't put a statue of Adolf Hitler up in the square, you shouldn't put statues of people who were committed to slavery up for people to, to all people, not just black people, but all people to look at and, and, and to have these people looming over you as people to be admired. So the, the move to remove those was in service of naming the history as a devastating attempt to extinguish a population. And certain words are tied to the same thing. So who uses those words, the N word, who uses um, the, the master slave words, who uses those words? The people who are committed to the agendas that will end in my extinction. And so hence um, the desire to move the, ex the, the ability to normalize that in regular language out of, out of, um, out of the way. Because it's really about how much of, of the um, dehumanization of black people, how much anti-blackness has been normalized in America as okay. And, and that language is, you know, the use of language is powerful as a normalizing factor. And so to go back and say, you know, it, a good one would be to think about referring to black people as slaves versus enslaved. Yes. 
you see? Yes, if you say, yeah, if you say, I, if I say I was enslaved, I'm still a person who a thing acted upon me. If you say I'm a slave, then that's who I am. And so those little shifts, they seem um, um, sort of unnecessary and they seem extreme, but they're actually fundamentally important to the conception of, of how we're talking about um, another human being. And, and it also shows why this project of building common ground or this as you know, meeting, because there are differences and there mm -hmm. are very radical differences. And if you leave the normal world as it is, there's hatred in that world. If you mm -hmm. confront the hatred you produce, hatred seems to me to be a core and very, very interesting conflict in, in, in your work, actually? Well, I think, you know, in the beginning, it's going to feel like too much to people. Yeah. You know, people are like, enough with the diversity <laughs> stuff. We did it. We, we sent a check to Black Lives Matter. Can't you move on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to move on. And, you know, but, but you cannot just take 400 years and fix it with a $25 check. That's you know that's not that's not going to work, and um, and the the culture has done so much work in dehumanizing black people um, that it's really a very slow and steady and painful excavation and rerouting of of how we know what we know. Well, I think we should end there because our time is up, but it's a wonderful place to end. And I want to recommend your books to everyone listening here and say, this is just such a good place to start, to get wiser and to be, there's a lot of discomfort and then this is difficult, but you learn, so, I le I've learned so much from, from your book and I've become so curious in our common world again. I, I just love your project. Thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to inform our Danish uh, listeners and viewers that Claudia's book can be bought at kronstork.dk, where we, three of them are translated into Danish. And they can be bought at the, the publishing house uh, webpage, kronstork.dk. And I would highly recommend that you read it and support this Danish publisher. Thank you and have a good Thank day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.